Good morning, everyone. I am, um, as she stated, an acute care nurse practitioner. Um, I currently work at the Franco Cardiovascular Center. My area is uh, heart failure and transplantation. So as we mentioned, we don't have a lot of time available. So I've attempted to get as much healthy tips as I could and um, the time frame allowed. Uh, so just bear with me, we're gonna dive right in. And I'm gonna start off by sharing some slides here. Hopefully you guys can see those. And again, tips for a heart, uh, a healthy heart here. So in order to kind of discuss this thoroughly, we need to first address some non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors for heart disease because those will help us to maintain our healthy hearts. Um, I, there are some slides, I believe, and some um, links in the chat to kind of help give you a little bit more background and data with some of these slides that I'm presenting. So one of the things that we absolutely cannot change is age, okay? So men over the age of 55 and women over the age of 65 are going to be at higher risk for heart disease just by way of age alone. Our vessels change over time. Uh, we've lived a nice life of, of sort of things that we've done in our lifestyle, things that we've uh, consumed, um, other comorbidities. So with that comes age and those things we can't change. Uh, gender, it's important to know that men are approximately three to five times more likely uh, to develop cardiovascular disease than women that are premenopausal. That's important because once a woman reaches menopause, her uh, chance of developing heart disease is about equal to that of a man. Um, and it's also important to know that younger women, despite the age, if they have comorbidities such as diabetes, their risk of heart disease is equal to that of a man as well. Um, and there's even studies that show that women are more likely to die of an actual heart attack than a man. And that, that could be because of presentation. Um, a lot of times women don't present with the very typical features that we're used to, um, you know, with the, the crushing chest pain, um, the numbness and tingling down the arm, the, uh, the sweating. Sometimes women present with other things such as nausea, um, just a, a general feeling of unwell. So we need to be aware as women, um, and I'm, I'm shooting for that because it's February, go red for women, um, is that we need to be aware that uh, we have different symptoms. So just don't blow those things off. Um, some other non-modifiable risk factors is you know, your genetics and behavioral factors. So that's important because when you think about behavioral factors, you think, well, that's modifiable. Well, to a degree, there's certain behaviors that we've done our entire age due to, you know, our entire life due to cultural um, differences or, or things that we believe in, like certain foods that you've grown up eating, or certain activities that you've been accustomed to your whole life. Those can be a part of family history, okay? And then, of course, genetic things such as a structural heart disease um, or just being genetically predisposed at an earlier age, say, of um, coronary artery disease or arrhythmias, okay? Um, so with that being said, if you're aware of any of these things in your family, it's really important that you get screening done. Um, we consider early heart disease uh, presentation of a man. Now, I've got on here men younger than 55 and women younger than 65, but ultimately we want to, you know, if you've known that you have heart disease in your family younger than 50, that's something you need to let your primary care physician or be aware of because they may want to start some early screening okay, on you. And then there's, there's several cardiac conditions, which I, I don't have a lot of time to go into, that have a strong familial correlation. Uh, so again, if you're aware of some of these things, you need to alert your primary care physician, make sure you're filling out those HMP, you know, those forms you get in the office, make sure you're filling those things out appropriately because that will give like a red flag so that they're aware they need to get you on board early. Um, some of the things that, I mean, I can focus on that I think are really important are, are things that we don't think about like sudden cardiac death of a family member. So this is gonna be, I think we've all heard of, you know, some young kid in college or a, a guy, you know, at the, at the baseball game who suddenly passed out and, you know, needed to have CPR, uh, their heart stopped, they needed to be defibrillated. Those are what we call sudden cardiac death events. And it can happen in, um, you know, a healthy, otherwise healthy young adult or middle-aged adult that we aren't aware of the underlying disease. That can sometimes be related or usually it's related to 
uh, fatal arrhythmias, there could be some structural defects. So if you are aware that someone in your family had a sudden cardiac event, that is definitely something you have to alert your family of. And then late onset of heart disease on both sides. So, you know, both grandparents ended up with heart attacks at, you know, 60, 70, again, reasons for screening early. Um, ethnicity uh, is another issue that we cannot change, right? We can't change who we are. So it's just, and again, I've got some links in the chat there, but there are uh, multiple studies. And I think we're sort of aware of certain higher risk populations with incidence of cardiovascular disease. Um, those populations, including African-Americans, uh, Hispanic populations, and even South Asian um, populations, uh, as well as Native Americans have a higher incidence of heart disease. Um, typically those higher incidences are related to other comorbidities as well, or can correlate. So. Um, we're talking things like high cholesterol, diabetes. Uh, if you have those other comorbidities, that's going to increase your risk okay, of heart disease. Or, and so just being aware of that. We'll, we'll get into the non-modifiable. So some of those things we can change. Okay. Um, so modifiable, what can we change? What can we do, right? So you get a lot of push, diet, um, exercise, activity level, lifestyle choices. When I'm speaking of lifestyle choices, I'm talking particularly to uh, smoking, uh, and that could be tobacco, uh, vaping, hookah, anything that you're inhaling in your lungs, okay, is considered um, smoking, if you will. Um, and then also um, illicit drug use. Um, certain drugs can cause cardiovascular events, certain stimulants, things that we don't think about, um, that are listed and even some prescribed meds that people are using in an incorrect manner can put you at higher risk for cardiac events. Um, and then uh, excessive alcohol use often can lead to uh, early heart failure, okay? Um, weight management, that's another thing that we can adjust and fix in the stress management, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit here. So eating healthy, so, you know, losing and, and maintaining a healthy weight, you know, we all hear about BMI, that's a huge facet in this country. I, I've got some stats here, which were kind of alarming, but essentially um, in America, in our country, approximately 40.3% of men and 39.7% of women are considered obese by the CDC. Um, that would, that's quite alarming, right? Because if we, if we already have that as a risk factor, that already increases every single disease pretty much that we can think of with cardiovascular being the number one killer of any American, okay, men, women, that's number one killer in this country right now is heart disease. So just wanna take that into account. Um, but when choosing healthy, you wanna choose the low sodium choices. Um, I, when I'm in clinic or talking with patients, my patients already have heart failure or heart disease. So we try to limit them to 2000 milligrams of sodium per day. I can tell you that the average American typically consumes about double that, about 4,000. So, you know, if you, if you don't have heart disease and 2,000 is too, too much, cut it in the middle. Try for 3,000, okay? And you can look at that on any label, anything that you're purchasing, you know, Google that our fingertips now. Be aware, oftentimes low sodium choices can have extra sugar, okay, or extra fat, and that's because they got to get that flavor. Um, so just be aware of what you're looking at for all contents, depending on your uh, background and other things you have cooking at home, particularly now in the middle of COVID is obviously safest, um, but it also allows you to do some meal prepping and planning. Those things alone cut your calories, cut your consumption because you're planning, you know what you're putting in there versus the restaurant. Okay, and then there's just something, I got a nice slide next called uh, choosing the perimeter or shopping the perimeter. Um, some of the dietitians use this, and I think it's pretty awesome. When you go into the grocery market, okay, you know how you got that perimeter, right? And it's like dairy, eggs, all the fresh veggies, fruits, that perimeter of the market are the things that you wanna focus on and where you wanna put all your shopping efforts. That center area is gonna contain anything that is um, prepackaged. So like I tell my patients, if it's in a bag, if it's in a box, if it's in a jar, it has sodium in it. It is preserved with sodium. That's the only way that the food stays fresh. Okay, and it's got tons of extra additives that we don't really know what those things do. So you wanna try and buy fresh and eat fresh when possible, okay? Getting moving, um, exercise, right? You know, four to five times a week, you've heard this. Well, in the middle of COVID, it's kind of hard, right? We, we go to gyms, 
but are those safe? Do you feel comfortable with the mask on while you're on the treadmill? You know, so you want to try to do those things at home if possible. I mean, you've got you know, brisk walking you can do, biking, stair climbing, um, you know, jumping in place at home, um, marching, dancing. Mm -hmm. There's so many things now that people are doing in terms of um, social media, you know, even adults now, like they're on TikTok and they're doing these new dance moves and learning. YouTube, there's a couple of free apps out there. Nike has a free app that you can download and do exercises. Um, and then I believe Fit On, which is like you can access that on your cable provider. That's also free with classes. So things like that you want to get into. And then don't forget your stress reduction. So those are going to be your more centered activities like yoga, um, you know, core work, um, doing plank, strengthening, even meditating. All those things can reduce your stress and even your blood pressure studies show, okay? So, and then classes in your community, Zoom, uh, community centers, YMCAs, all those things now have virtual classes. So you can still be active and even interact with people if not going out, okay? Um, next, so special considerations, when I talk about all those activities are, I have to make a point particularly about uh, heart disease patients, is going outside in the cold, shoveling snow, you know, placing the ice, things like that. If you have known heart disease, you really wanna be cautious and take frequent breaks. Uh, cold temperatures can cause what we call a vasoconstriction of the arteries or kind of like narrowing due to the temperature. And if you've already got known blockages, that can cause angina or intermittent chest pain, which kind of can feel like a heart attack. Usually it goes away once the activity goes away, but just being aware of that. And then protecting your seniors because you know they don't have as much body fat as they get older. Um, and so they can go out and think that they're warm and really they aren't and they're at risk for hypothermia. And then as well as, you know, just kind of avoiding anything alcohol and, you know, induced before you go out because it, has a false sensation of being warm and you can think you're warmer than you are in those weathers. Okay, managing stress. Again, just some, some tips on here. I think we kind of focused on a little bit earlier, but you know, turning off the television, meditation, quiet time. It's so much on CNN now, right? So just getting away from that, maybe focusing on like organizing your home, getting adequate sleep and rest. And if you are running into problems, you know, be aware that there are free counseling services out there, virtual services with your provider. Um, Michigan Medicine has wonderful hotlines you can call if you're, you know, feeling like you are in a bad place and thinking of harming yourself. So just be aware of all these resources and reaching out to them as needed. Okay. And then last but not least, uh, keeping up with your physician, your nurse practitioner, your provider, and making sure that you're keeping your office appointments, you're keeping your prescriptions current, things like that, using telehealth services and virtual visits, because oftentimes now people are afraid to go into the office. They're afraid to go into the ED because of COVID. Or, you know, I've had so many patients say, well, I didn't want to come in. I waited because I, did, I didn't want to be exposed. But honestly, with heart disease, there is no time to wait. You have to present the rules have not changed. Chest pain, chest pressure, pain in both arms, you know, those sorts of things need to come in and be evaluated. You'll see that when waiting, and I've experienced this where patients will come in, and now we've got irreversible damage to the heart. Okay, now we've got, we need a stent. Or now we've waited too long, it, it's too late to have a stent. Now you've got, you know, heart failure developing in the future. Um, you have more medications now, you have more tests, more procedures, more money that's being spent now by you, by the healthcare system. Um, so just be aware if you're having any of those things, you want to come in, you want to make yourself a priority. And I think that's kind of all that I had within the time frame. I hope it wasn't too rushed. I hope that I was able to give across enough information. And uh, Patricia, are we ready for questions? Absolutely. Oh. I think I'm hearing some background that everything okay. Um, so we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, one question, is it necessary to have all the heart attack symptoms to call for help? I would say no. Chest pain is probably the biggest one that you want to be aware of. Um, and I put some of them there on the slide, but particularly chest pain, you want to be able to come in. Um, but diabetic patients aren't always going to have the very symptoms. So anytime you're feeling unwell, uneasy, chest pain, lightheadedness, dizziness, palpitate, you know, heart racing, anything that you know is not a normal, you need to seek care. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I think I heard you tell me that I'm not supposed to be shoveling snow, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, we do have another question. What is the primary concern after recovering from a heart attack? Okay, so the primary concern after recovering from a heart attack, believe it or not, is getting active. Um, we actually put patients, if we can, right into cardiac rehab. You know, years ago, we used to treat you, you know, stay home, get rest. Now we realize that that heart is a muscle and it's the most important one in your body. So you need to get that moving in a protective setting, right? Cardiac rehab, things like that. Get back, get moving so that that heart can get where it needs to be. Changing your diet is never a bad idea. Okay, so those are the two biggest things you need to think about to get back to track. Thank you so much, um, um, Nurse Cunningham. I think that's all the questions that we have for you this morning. We really appreciate you being on the call today.